Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Yes. We're, once again, we are filming this aboard the Vision of the Sea, somewhere out in the North Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. on our way over to, first to Portugal, and then on to uh, Spain, a couple of stops in Spain, and then Barcelona, before we make our way through France and over to Europe, over to England. No. That's what I meant to say. Yes. Um, we are continuing on. This is the third and final part of our study on tradition, based on Jesus' statement in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. He is talking about tradition versus the commandment of God, okay? So if you've missed either of those two, it's really worth your time to go back and see those prior to this one, okay? Um, we've talked in the last two about tradition and how tradition, in so many cases, has supplanted the Word of God, okay? And that's the danger, and Jesus talked about this, saying to the Pharisees, how nicely you set aside the commandment of God to hold fast to your traditions. But after all of that, on the first two programs, Alice said to me, well, are there no good traditions? And this... I said that Paul had said something about keeping the traditions. Basically, you said, are there no good traditions? And my answer was a very simple, yes, there are. And that's what we want to look at today. The difference between a, a, a tradition that has a good foundation and is, is of the Lord and one that is not. So, but before we do that, I'm just going to pray, Father, that you would bless our time together because it is our desire, it is our great desire, it is our grand desire to truly be led by your word, Lord God that lamp, that light that you have given us to lead us in paths of righteousness. And we don't want to be distracted or we don't want to be, we don't want to be deceived for certain. So we know that we need to abide in your word, that we would know the truth and that truth would set us free from it. So Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this time in your word and we thank you for your Holy Spirit sent to lead us into all truth. Father, I just ask your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. As I said, Alice mentioned that, that Paul had talked about tradition. The simple answer is no. There are good, it's like habits. There are good habits and there are bad habits. And traditions can be good or bad. Now, the Apostle Paul, as Alice just mentioned, who's been quoted so many times in this study about tradition in the law, was not against tradition. He was, how, now listen to what I'm saying. Paul was not against tradition. He was opposed to the tradition of men. Okay? This is the distinction. There is a tradition that originates with men. And Jesus said this in Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read. He said, The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. So uh, there he is talking about the tradition of men. Then Paul, in Colossians, in the second chapter of Colossians, says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men. Okay? But he also said, to the Corinthians, he said, Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions 
just as I delivered them to you. So there were traditions that Paul delivered to the church, and he is praising them because they held firmly to them. To the Thessalonians, he wrote, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter, from us. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So think about what he said, just as I delivered them. Traditions that you were taught from us. Tradition which you received from us. So then, what is the difference between the good and the bad? What makes the traditions that were passed along by Paul good and the traditions passed along by the elders, the Pharisees and the lawyers, the religious leaders, what makes they were bad? What makes a difference? Well, the answer is simple. Where they originate. Okay? Paul said to the Corinthians again, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And talks about the gospel that he received, right? He said that he had received it. From where? And then he said to the Galatians, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he wrote, <clears throat> that's, that's Paul, okay, let me bring in Peter for a minute, okay? Peter said, but know this first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy of, and pro was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Second Peter chapter 1. So the difference is, these are the apostles who are receiving the word straight from God, from the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit to pass them along. Whereas the tradition of the elders, the tradition of the fathers, the tradition of men that the scripture is talking about, and that we've talked about so much over the past couple of programs, that comes from people leaning on their own understanding. That came from people who thought that the scriptures were inadequate. And they need to have those inadequacies filled by them. That here, okay, God told you to do this. Now they're going to explain to you exactly how you are obligated to do those things. Okay? Remember what, uh, let me go back one more time to Paul. It says, Second Corinthians, the first Corinthians, he said, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things... God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Okay? And then he goes on, and back to 1 Corinthians, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So he's passing along what he received direct from God. Now remember, this is the Apostle Paul that I'm talking about, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who was born of the Pharisees, who was a leader in the Pharisees. And in... in Philippians, in chapter 3 in Philippians, he talks about how he left all that behind. Choosing to leave it behind. He says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on towards the goal. Paul was a sold-out bondservant of the Lord who was bold enough to say, be an imitator of me even as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. All right? He could say that because he knew that, that like Jesus, Jesus never spoke what he had not heard from the Father. That's what it says in John 12, like 49 and 50. Jesus never did anything he had not seen the Father do, John 5, 19. So therefore, he was also able to say, for this reason, we also constantly thank God when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. Amen. That's the difference between what we receive from God through teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, you know, like it says, and what we get from people who lean on their own understanding and, and think that, you know, that they're, the, they're fulfilling the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent to lead us into all truth, okay? I've said this so many times. God didn't send me to lead you into all truth. No, there's a place, uh, obviously there's a place for teachers, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be spending my time doing this. But as I said to you all the time, test what I say. Test it against the Word of God. Make sure that it is the Word of God that I'm speaking. Okay? Because if it comes from me, 
I'm talking about, it's not something I'm passing along. If it comes from me, question it. Be skeptical. Test it. Test it. Like be a Berean. Like the Bereans. Yeah, like the Bereans. They tested all the things. Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of writing. I've done a lot of teaching. And I say this because there's a word that's very dangerous. Plagiarism. Plagiarize. I've written books. You know what I put in my books I wrote? I plagiarize everything. One of the best sermons I ever preached. It's called the, the Attitude of the Righteous. And it's from Paul in his letter to the Philippians. The whole thing comes from me. I didn't originate anything. I didn't think any of this stuff up. It's, it's God's word. <laughs> you know, it doesn't depend on me leaning on my own understanding. It depends on me being faithful to hear from God and pass along what I hear. Yes. Okay. Don't be afraid to plagiarize if indeed what you're plagiarizing is the word of God. Jesus didn't speak anything unless he heard it from the Father. But you want to know something? He gave the Father credit for it all, didn't he? <laughs> but if you're not hearing it from the Father... Then shut up your face. You're hearing it from someone. Yeah, if you're, not hearing, if you're not hearing from God, that's why it says, you know, we have to learn. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Okay? If, you, if you're not hearing things from God and you're speaking, okay. Let me say this carefully and clearly. If you're not hearing from God or have not heard from God and you are speaking, you are sinning. Now, how can I say such a, such a thing? Because it says anything not done in faith is sin. And faith comes by hearing. So if you haven't received it from God, and you're going speaking it, you're doing it not in faith, and you're sinning. How do you tell the, the commandment of God from the tradition of men? How do you do that? How can you keep from following error? Or as somebody inspired by the Holy Spirit once said, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Psalm 119, verse 9. You have to learn, you have to train yourself to, to be led by the word of God, that lamp and that light, right? Abiding in the word. Test it against the word, the word of God. And that must be consistent. You know, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah, what is it now, 2,800 years ago or a long time ago, and said, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. You need to be testing. It's not judgmental for when you're listening to, to preachers and teachers that you're testing what they're saying. You know, Paul, Alice mentioned that. Paul said that about the Bereans. He said he, they were more noble-minded than any others because they tested everything that he said. They tested, how did they test it? Searching the scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. That be, better become our practice. How do you know the truth? Well, Jesus said, and I'm sure you know this. I'm hoping you know this. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Free from what? Free from error. Free from deception. Free from all of that. What is, but what does it mean to abide in the Word? Abide means to live. To live. To live in the Word. You, you, gotta, you have to ask yourself. And by the way, it doesn't mean that you spend every waking moment reading the Word. But it should mean that you spend every waking moment meditating on the Word. Considering the Word. Obeying, obeying the Word. Obeying the Word. Right? You know, it says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he says that the, the natural man does not accept, cannot accept, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually appraised. The things of God are spiritually appraised. What's in your life that is not of God? It doesn't belong there if it's not of God. Right. And if it, if it is of God, then you need to be spiritually appraising it, right? I had, when I was a, a young guy, uh, I was just getting ready to go into the Navy, going, to, going into the Navy. <laughs> a long time ago, guys. I had a friend. We lived in New York. I lived in New York. This would be long before we got married. And I had a friend who was a jewelry, uh, I don't know what you can call it, a diamond cutter in the Diamond Center down in Manhattan in New York City. And I don't know what brought this up, but he wanted to make me a ring 
So I was going to get a, a blue sapphire ring in white gold. That's pretty cool. So he invited me down, which, by the way, not everybody gets into where they cut diamonds. So he got into this place and he was showing me. He was so trained, so expert at being able to appraise and evaluate diamonds. Okay, that was his business. It was his life. And I was thinking about this. That takes train. I, I'm not a I'm not a jeweler, but I understand that like diamonds, it's all about four things. It's about the the carats, the size of it, right? The color of it, clarity. the clarity, and the other thing. <laughs> There's four C's, which I don't remember right now. So they they study it and they know that, and he knows all this stuff. But you know, when it came time to appraise some kind of stone, he didn't just look at it. Even with all of his training, no, you know what he did? He got out the loop. He got out that little magnifying glass and he put it in his eyes and he would look at that. Because unless he used that thing to look through, he couldn't evaluate the worth of a diamond. In the same fashion, you can be trained all you want about, you can be a theologian, but if you don't look at things through the Word of God, you're not going to rightly appraise Him. You have to train yourself. So spend time in the Word as much as you can. But then what's really important is when you're out living your daily life, if you are looking at everything through the Word of God, evaluating and testing everything according to that Word, that you're meditating on that Word. Okay. You're supposed to be, if you are saved, well, you're, you're supposed to be a child of God led by the Spirit. Isn't that what it says in Romans? It says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Romans 8.14. So that is, of course, the Holy Spirit of whom Jesus spoke when he said, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. John 16, 13. Even the Holy Spirit had to hear. I mean, you know, the, the highest man, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We know God to be one in three persons the father jesus the son and the holy spirit but even there there's good order and it all kind of originates from the father so one of the primary ways that the holy spirit he the holy spirit leads us into the truth about tradition is called discernment we're supposed to be able to discern the spirits right in these perilous last days when people are calling good evil and evil good, and who are substituting darkness for light and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, that's what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5, right? That's what he said would happen. In these last days, when, as Jesus said, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many, Matthew 24, 11. In these perilous last days, when, as Paul wrote to Timothy, Men will hold to a form of godliness but deny its power. And then he went on to say, that's in the, cha the third chapter, that whole third chapter of the second letter to Timothy. But then he went on to say, for the time will come, now is, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. And this is why John would write, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. And as I said, you know, it says, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they're spiritually, they're, they're foolishness to him. Foolish. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. The things in the Word seem foolish to you? You better take a breath and check yourself. We have to test, we have to learn to test the spirits. We need to learn to test whether something is coming from God or coming from men. How can you do that? Back to the Word. Does it line up with the Word? Does it agree with the Word? Is it part of the whole Word? Or is somebody just picking and choosing the parts that are ear-tickling? And there are ear-tickling parts. Yes. All right? The Holy Spirit, when you have the Holy Spirit, you have this, like, 
red flags that go off when you hear something. It should it, set off alarms. Yeah, you, you just know there's something wrong with that. Absolutely, it should. It should set off the alarms. But that's from comes from from having a, that right relationship with the Holy Spirit, exactly. of which you are the right. temple, and knowing the Word of God. Yes. That something, well, that just doesn't sound right. It sounds off. Right. And something is tickling your spirit that are alone because it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Exactly. Go check. Make sure that you're familiar with the Word. The more familiar you are with the Word of God, I promise you, the harder it's going to be for anybody to fool you, to trick exactly. you, to deceive you. And that's exactly what the devil, that old serpent, wants to do. He wants to deceive you. He is a liar by nature and the father of lies. And he came, his desire is to kill you. Now, you know what? I'm not talking about the kill the flesh. Oh, he probably wants to do that. But he is trying to separate you from God. Because that is true and spiritual death. That is his goal, is to separate you from God. Here, here's a verse I've done a lot of teaching on, and I, you really have to get into this and think about this, right? Now, you know it says in Proverbs that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. There's a lot of immaturity around, okay? But immaturity is not about age. I don't, I don't believe that. Immature, you know, I, I got to tell you, I've, let, I've met a lot of older folks who are very, very immature, okay? And I've met some young folks on fire for God who are truly, truly mature. So maturity is not about how many days you have walked along this planet. Maturity is about how committed you are to serving the Lord God Almighty. How committed you are in that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what maturity is about. So it says in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food, the meat of the word, is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You're supposed to train your senses to discern good and evil. You're supposed to be better at it today or than you were a month ago because you're training yourself. It's exercise. I think the King James says exercising, okay? The more you exercise, the stronger you get, okay? Your senses. How many of you out there have common sense? We're not supposed to have common sense. The reason it's common is because everybody got it. And it says, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What we are supposed to have is something in totally different. Instead of common sense, we are supposed to be able to sense the presence of God in our lives. And that changes your life. So how do you do that? You train your senses. You know, it's, and we talked about this in the last couple of studies a lot. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, how do you get transformed by the renewing of your mind? You know, if you were a computer, you know, you got your brain up here in your brain box. <clears throat> you can't just open your head and stuff a Bible down into it and all of a sudden you got the Word. No. It has to come to you through the input devices. God has given you input devices that send information to your brain. Sensors. What are, the, the, these are what are your senses. You're hearing. You're seeing. You're smelling. You're tasting. You're touching. Those are the five senses that God has given us that put information into your brain. Now, you know, it says in Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. We are so incredibly designed. But, and that was God's design. Give us five senses. Adam and Eve, both had, Adam and the woman had five senses in the garden. They could see all of the animals. They could see all of the beauty of this garden. You know, in those days, you, you didn't uh, I don't want to sidetrack me. Because the one commandment from God was, don't eat from the tree of the fruit. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, you want to know something? Did that mean that Adam didn't know any good? Adam didn't know any evil? Well, the answer is, of course he knew good. There was nothing but. There was God, no evil. There was, God looked down and looked at everything he had created when he was finished creating and said, it is good. What he didn't know was evil. Now you need to know the difference between good and evil, all right? You have to be able to discern between good and evil. But he gave you ears for hearing. Yes. Thank God. For hearing what? Rap music? No. No, he gave you ears for hearing his voice, that sweet, gentle voice, because faith 
comes by hearing. And that has to be the beginning, the origin of all things. You know, you if you're saved, you're looking at me and you have a relationship with God, it is for one reason and one reason only. Because you heard him call you by name and you responded. He's called us by name. That's what it says. And all faith comes by hearing, hearing his voice. And that has to be the foundation of everything that we do, is hearing his voice. We're like radios. You can tune in one and tune out another, because it's a very noisy world we live in. You have to practice tuning your hearing into the voice of God. He gave us a... You have two of them. You got two. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's right. Two ears, one mouth. That's right. <laughs> Be quick to listen, slow so to speak. speak. We have to listen uh, more than we speak. What did he give you eyes for? Well, I mean, so you could walk down Fifth Avenue and look at all of the... No, he gave you eyes so you could see him and see the glory of his creation. They, but wh why do you think it says we're to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher, the perfecter of our faith? That's what we're supposed to be looking at. There's a song I love so much, you know, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow slowly, strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When you focus on Jesus, other things will begin to fade out. The things that were important to you will begin to fade. The things that attracted you will begin to fade. And you know what will attract you? Jesus Christ. God gave you a mouth. For what? To taste and see. To taste and see that the Lord is good. Because that's what nourishes you. Man does not live by bread alone. You are nourished by the word of God. It is sweeter than honey to our taste. Hallelujah. He gave you a nose so you could smell what? The sweet aroma of his presence. We live in a stinky world. This whole world is polluted by the transgressions of man. Tra you know, pollution didn't start when they had an industrial revolution a uh, hundred and some odd years ago. Pollution started. Isaiah 24. God, this is what God said. The whole earth is polluted by the transgressions of men. Sin is stinky. Yes. It's stinky in the nostrils of God, and it should be stinky to you. So, listen, smell that aroma of his presence. God gave you hands. Not so you could grab out and reach out and grab the stuff that the world is putting there in front of you to, to trap you and get you off that, that path of righteousness. So that you could touch the hem of his garment. So that you could walk with him hand in hand in the garden. That's why God gave you hands. So you could reach out and touch others, to encourage them, to bless them, to pray with them. It says, agree, if two of you agree touching them. Anything, right? So we, we have to, it's, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen naturally. Yeah. It happens supernaturally. And it happens because you practice it. It's that solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I promise you, you need to know the difference between good and evil. Because there's so much evil out there that, like Paul said to the Corinthians, Satan came, came as an angel of light, so much, how much more his, his ministers. They come dressed in robes, looking religious. But they can deceive you if you are not. They'll give you traditions the traditions of men. But Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you train us with your word. We thank you that you lead us with your word. We thank you that you speak to us, Lord God, that our joy might be made full. We thank you, Lord God, for all of the blessings. And our great desire is to be faithful to you, to truly walk hand in hand humbly with you, Lord God. That's our desire. And we look forward to that day when we will do it hand in hand physically. And we will look face to face that we might be like you when we see you as you are. God bless you. And until next time, bye-bye. So I cherish not all rugged cross till